Hi there, it's the Autumn Garden Tips and Tour and we'll be looking at what worked and what didn't and what we can take away from that. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and I'll put links to any resources I mention in the description below and if you're new here the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. The Middle Sized Garden is a walled town garden. It's 100 feet long and 80 feet wide at its widest, but it's an L shape, so it's 40 feet wide nearer the house. We're in South East England, so we tend to say that we equate to a USDA hardiness zone of nine because our winters are very mild. It's rare for us to go below minus six Celsius, 21 Fahrenheit. But of course, our summers are usually nowhere near as hot as a USDA zone nine would be. And a good summer's day might be 23 Celsius, 80 Fahrenheit. But this summer was really shockingly hot. We had a record breaking heat wave and drought and hit temperatures of 40 Celsius and 100 Fahrenheit. And that's still affecting the garden. When I come out of the back door, I cross the terrace and I go up some steps into what we call the parterre. And on the right hand side is my sunny border, which is where I concentrate all my most colorful flowers. And that is what got hit really badly in the current summer because a sunny border is much more exposed to things like heat and drought. All the shady borders survived much better. And there are two plants in particular that looked as if they died and I left them there and I watered them. I've recently heard a talk by gardening writer Christine Walkden about watering and she said the most important thing is not to water every day when it's very hot. Water once or twice a week but use lots of water, something like a full watering can around the roots of each plant. And that's what I did. But I didn't cut back any dead material or anything like that and indeed in previous videos such as the how to deal with dying plants video I did with Harry Baldwin at Board Hill Gardens. Harry advised us if in doubt do nothing. And I got quite a cross email from a subscriber who said well I don't want to leave dead plants sitting in my garden for any longer than I need to why would I so I thought it was worth explaining why you would when plants are exposed to unexpected extremes of weather like for example a sudden freeze at the beginning of spring when they've started to come out of their winter dormancy or a heat wave in the summer Sometimes in order to survive they go into dormancy, it's called summer dormancy or back into winter dormancy, which means they just cut down to the very minimum in order to keep the plant alive. The problem is cutting a plant back or cutting it down stimulates growth. So if you cut things away when a plant is already struggling to survive, you may overstimulate it and put it under even more stress. Of course, it doesn't mean that you should leave every dead plant for ages. You're gonna have to take a judgment on that. The dahlia came back completely, but its flowers were very late. Uh, the persicaria just completely came back. It's been a really good presence in the autumn garden. I am about to do a major revamp on this main border. For years, I've just been stuffing plants in here and there. And of course, it's become very incoherent. Uh, but the extreme weather has really shown up the weaknesses in the plants. For example, I have a plant called daylilies, which is really aggressive and it's suppressed quite a lot of plants I've planted. It's a thug. And yet, in this hot summer, it just shriveled up and died. And really, I don't want a plant that's a thug in normal summers and yet isn't around in difficult summers. If you're interested in how to revamp a border, then that video is in the description below. And I have to say it's rather terrifying because I am completely clearing it. And more and more space is appearing. And I'm getting more and more nervous about what I'm actually doing. But I'll keep you in touch in videos about it over the next year. Now, if I go up the second set of steps, we go out into the open lawn and I've got another long border along the back of the garden. This long border at the back has really suffered from this year's heat and drought and a number of plants have failed. The Japanese anemones, usually so incredibly reliable, have virtually not flowered this year. And some nymphophia also are barely even present in the border. And there are great gaps where I can see that other things haven't come through. Two boxwoods have died, not, I think, from any box tree moth caterpillar or from box blight. We've got the topiary here and that really is taking the structure for autumn and winter and early spring. And in the autumn, it's time to start trimming your topiary. We did ours about a month ago. And these are home oaks 
The big one is a holly, holly golden king, and the small lollipops are privet. Generally, I'm trying to avoid boxwoods in tapery because even though I haven't got the boxwood moth caterpillar or box blight, they are quite close to me, and I'm sure it's just a question of time. I've got a video on the three best alternatives to box, which I'll put in the description below. But otherwise, with these borders, I'm just going to experiment like mad. When we're digging up the main border, I'm going to put all sorts of plants into this back border. I think at the moment it really is just a question of trial and error and seeing what takes. But there are a few plants that have done really well there. And one of them has been Fuchsia Delta Sarah, which has been flowering for months in this garden. And it is so pretty. It's just over now, but I've had four months of flowers out of it. So I thought I would check the care instructions because I have honestly never done anything to this plant. And the care instructions for Delta Sarah are that it can be tender and may need winter protection, that it may need watering in dry periods of the summer, and it needs fertilising in order to flower well. Well, I've never done any of that. And it made me think about gardening advice. In our homes, we can paint our walls exactly the colour we want and put our furniture exactly where we want it to get the effect that we want. But in the garden, nature's in charge. And I think it can be very puzzling for new gardeners to realise that sometimes you need to follow the rules, sometimes you don't need to follow the rules. And finding out whether you need to follow them or not is really just a question of trial and error. What this means is that if something goes wrong, it's not really your fault and you can learn from it. So in order to get this message across, we've created a line of t-shirts and hoodies and tote bags with these messages. For example, I interview lots of really good gardeners on the middle sized garden and most of them say to me that at some point they've had plants fail on them. So if at first you don't succeed, plant, plant, plant again. And of course, gardeners learn by trial and error or even trowel and error. And many people say there are no mistakes in gardening, just experiments. So that's what our t-shirts and hoodies are all about. And our niece, Irene, is very kindly going to be modeling them for us. I wouldn't call myself an organic gardener because I don't really want to be restricted by the label, but I do find that it saves me time, effort and money to try and garden with nature rather than trying to control it. So I use a minimum of chemicals and I try to garden in a sustainable way. And that's why I'm really pleased to be working with Tea Mill on this because they use natural organic fabrics and their manufacturing is done with renewable energy and the packaging is plastic free. One of the things of course we do in autumn is we have to deal with autumn leaves and recently the Royal Horticultural Society said that if leaves fall on your border leave them there because they'll rot down to add nutrition to the soil and they'll make a lovely habitat for wildlife. Whereupon a major national newspaper in its comment pages where it usually sort of talks about sort of major things of politics then put a little comment in saying well of course it's a ridiculous thing to say because leaves are blown around and if you leave leaves on your border they'll blow all over your garden and I just wanted to examine that because I actually did an experiment a few years ago where I piled up a huge number of leaves and put them on one of my borders and they never moved but generally if leaves fall on your borders. Borders are quite damp places and the leaves will probably stay there. The leaves that you see blowing around the streets and pavements have often fallen on a dry day, a windy day. They've dried and they fly around everywhere. And the other thing is, is that when they get blown against walls and fences, and many borders are against walls and fences, the wind can't get behind them to blow them out again. And that's why you see leaves sort of jammed into corners and they just stay there until someone sweeps them away. If you have island beds, it's possible that leaves will get blown off them. But if your borders are against fences or walls, then you're safe to leave the leaves where they fall on the borders. The only exception I would say is those very big leathery leaves from trees like Magnolia grandiflora, which can suppress the smaller plants. So I'd have a look through and just check them, but maybe just push the leaves aside rather than doing a great big must get the leaves off the border. One plant I'd like to recommend for autumn is nerines. They're bulbs. Their common name is Guernsey lily or Bowden lily. This is Nerin Bowdenii, which is the hardy version. And you can plant them as bulbs in August and you just make sure the bulb is poking above the level of the soil. Or you can even plant them now in the autumn when they're actually flowering. Nerines really don't like disturbance, so I wouldn't put them in a border, but they're a great thing for lining a path or at the bottom of a wall. And they may take a couple of years before they really start flowering. But when they do start flowering, 
they give you weeks of autumn colour and I really think they are very pretty. I've got an autumn garden tips playlist which I will put at the end of this video. And let me know what you think and thank you for watching. Goodbye.